No. Well, Did I say it wrong? Kind of, sort of. How do I say it? Oskari <laughs> Saarinen. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Os- Oscar works. Just- Oscar? Okay, yeah. Okay, we'll yeah. go with Oscar. Okay, so Oscar's, <laughs> I feel so bad. My name's like three letters and it's super easy to say, so I, I don't really understand the hardships. And- Okay, so he's going to be talking about how we can use some open source databases rather than using the ones that Google or Amazon or Azure provide in our cloud platforms. So it's going to be a super interesting talk because he's trying to avoid vendor lock-in, which is kind of how we operate sometimes. So super excited to see this. <laughs> Take it away. All right, thanks. So yeah, I'm Oskari, and uh, I'm going to be talking about the different open, open source database services in the clouds and, and what alternatives you have there. So uh, I'll start with a little bit of an introduction uh, on what, what we do and, and who I am and uh, we want to talk about managed uh, cloud services and, and the different kinds of databases that are available in the, in the clouds. <coughs> so from re- relational databases to distributed key value stores and, and message streaming and, and such. And also uh, finally also uh, talking about the uh, typical data pipeline scenario that we see being used in, in clouds using open source software. So I'm uh, CEO and one of the founders of Ivan, uh, Infinite Cloud, Cloud Database as a Service Company. Uh, we previously, previously I was working as a database consultant, mostly focusing on Postgres and other da- uh, open source databases, as well as uh, software architect designing large uh, scalable systems for, for various enterprises. Uh, open source software is, is something I've worked with uh, for a long time since since the 90s and, and uh, created and uh, maintained a bunch of different open source tools, mostly around uh, uh, databases and data management and things like that. All, a lot of them are related to Postgres, but I've uh, recently also been working with other technologies. When I started working on, on Linux, I, I just looked up the uh, first Linux distribution I actually used, which was this Digrasil's uh, plug and play Linux, and that was in, I think, 94 or something, and it really wasn't as plug and play as, as you would hope, and unfortunately, in a way, I think open source uh, uh, tools are, are still in that, that, that phase that they're really, there's a really good technology there, but it, it's also more of a set of tools to build something cool out of instead of a, like fully, fully uh, polished complete solution for you. So that's one of the reasons why we uh, founded Ivan, uh, where we try to make, make it as easy as possible for, for everybody to benefit from the open source databases and, and all, the, all the work and innovation going into, into different open source technologies. So we run, run open source databases on, on uh, five different uh, public clouds, so AWS, Google Cloud Azure, DigitalOcean, and AppCloud, and make sure that they're Databases are, are available in all those clouds and, and, and as easy as possible to use. Uh, our team is based in, in Helsinki, Finland, and, and uh, Boston, US, uh, but we're going to be also launching a presence here in APEC uh, later this year. Right now, we, have, we run and operate seven different uh, open source databases uh, in di- seven different regions around the world. So that includes uh, 23 in, in APEC and quite a few in, in Singapore. So, when we look at managed cloud services, uh, this term means sometimes different things for different people. But it's what we're trying to uh, talk about right here is is kind of the space between the infrastructure, so the hardware and the virtual machines, and the actual applications at, at top. So, so we're focusing on on a layer that's sometimes called the platform as a service or database as a service, where where databases are are made available for you uh, over an API request or similar thing that just provides you with an uh, access point to the database without having to install any database software or, or necessarily tune it at all. There are uh, quite a few quite a few vendors in this this uh, space. Uh, there are the big big uh, cloud uh, service providers. AWS, Google, and Microsoft, who have uh, complete solutions that, that kind of cover all parts of the stack. And we also have these uh, other somewhat smaller smaller uh, cloud, 
cloud uh, infra providers such as DigitalOcean and AppCloud, I guess Rackspace would fall in some, somewhere there, who give you easy uh, API access to, to new VMs and, and infrastructure resources, but don't necessarily provide uh, other higher level services. Then there's a, uh, a bunch of uh, players such as uh, us, so Ivan, and uh, there's Compose, which is uh, IBM's company nowadays, and, and Heroku, uh, providing more of uh, uh, development platforms and database management as a service. And this is an, an of course, since I'm, I'm working on it, I think it's an interesting space to, <laughs> to work on, and where uh, we're also able to, to uh, uh, really provide uh, open source services for, for uh, a large number of, of end users. I didn't really touch on, on the SaaS layer and applications because I'm working on the layers be below that, but it's a lot of these uh, SaaS applications are built on top of, of the PaaS and, and IAS uh, systems. Uh, I think what we've seen in, in, in uh, uh, of course, our, our customer base and the people we talk to, but, but more generally in the industry is that Pretty much nobody is, is spinning up new data centers for running with like databases or other services on premises anymore. There's of course a lot of, lot of them still in existence, uh, but the de facto stand, uh, like deployment target for new systems is, is some kind of a cloud. So I think like AWS EC2 uh, was the first one that kind of started moving here, and uh, that's where where uh, a lot of things are being deployed. But in in addition to just uh, running VMs in the cloud, we, we see more and more of, of uh, users now starting to use services like AWS RDS or, or uh, uh, Google's uh, Cloud SQL or Cloud Data Store or, or similar uh, data, data management systems in the cloud. Uh, a lot of these, these services are based on open source, so there's uh, Postgres, for example, is available from, from quite a few different vendors. Uh, but it's, uh, the cloud services are also also introducing more and more uh, new types of distributed databases that are are proprietary and only available from one of these vendors. So we look into into the options available in in different uh, paradigms. Uh, there's also uh, when we look at open source source uh, databases and and, uh, and also proprietary databases, you have a couple of options uh, available for you when, when operating in the cloud. So you can just get the VM resources and, and compute resources from the from the cloud and, and install everything everything there yourself, which gives you full control on the system. And it's probably something you need to do if you just want to take an existing database from on premises and, and move it to the cloud. But it's it's also gonna gonna still uh, have you worry about the maintenance and and, and uh, management of those systems. So it's. It's pretty resource in intensive, intensive and, and requires uh, personnel to, to operate those systems. Sometimes that's not what you want to do. You want to have your developers work on, on actual applications, not on the infrastructure. So that's why you would consider using a managed uh, database provider, uh, which typically makes it a lot faster to, to spin up new instances. Uh, one of the, the uh, <coughs> benefits in, in using, using somebody else's Databases managed by somebody else is that you also may get access to these these cool proprietary databases that are developed by companies like AWS and, and Google uh, and Microsoft, where you get like scalable huge systems. But but since we're talking about open source services, that's not a, uh, a given plus in the, in this case. It also has the possibility of locking you into a single provider. On the relational database side, uh, we have a number of robust uh, open source databases like Postgres, uh, which I'm most familiar with, and, and of course MySQL and MariaDB. And all, all of these services are, are, or databases are available as managed uh, services from a large number of vendors. So, so the big uh, cloud providers, as well as uh, smaller smaller players such as us and, and Compose, Heroku, ClearDB, and, and other other vendors. So if you're working with relational databases, and uh, as we just uh, saw in Christopher's talk uh, 20 minutes ago, uh, these traditional relational databases such as Postgres can get you pretty far. So you probably don't really need to consider going for, for uh, 
a huge uh, uh, like going for for proprietary databases or even for things like Hadoop and Cassandra, unless you have really tons and tons of data. So if you're working with like single digit terabytes of data, Postgres is probably going to be just fine for most use cases, and it's going to be a lot simpler than, than many of the other alternatives. But if you if you want to or if you need to go to to distributed key value types of databases and and scale to hundreds of nodes, you probably don't want to do that anymore with Postgres. I guess it's possible. I don't know what's the largest Postgres clusters out there. Probably something that Skype ran with uh, ages ago. But nowadays, it, it looks like uh, things like Cassandra are, are most commonly used in the open source space. Cassandra is, is a, a, a distributed da a key value database that was that's based on, on the Dynamo uh, paper that was uh, created by Amazon. Uh, almost 10 years ago, I believe, uh, which is also the basis for uh, AWS DynamoDB service, which is a really good good uh, database system, but it's, it's also totally proprietary to Amazon, and, uh, and if you put your data there, you'll have complete vendor locking with, with Amazon, no way out, really. So that's that's where our, our recommendation would be to look into Cassandra or, or Scylla, which is a re-implementation of Cassandra uh, by a different team. There are also uh, a number of companies uh, providing providing Cassandra and Spill as, as fully managed uh, services. So, so if you're just worried about the complexity of, of setting up all of this, uh, you don't really have to have to go to the proprietary services to make it easier for you. I can also get it as a managed uh, service from from uh, companies like Compose, Instacluster, or or us. Uh, Another interesting interesting uh, uh, type of databases is these distributed relational databases, which uh, for a long time were only available, I guess, internally for Google with their Spanner system, which is I think uh, was a pretty unique system as it allowed you to have a globally consistent relational database with uh, pretty high availability guarantees. But that that required a, a lot of uh, specialized uh, hardware and software and. Uh, Huge clusters that, that typically didn't really make sense to run in-house, even if you had access to that kind of system. Nowadays, there are also also uh, uh, open source uh, projects and companies working on on uh, implementing similar systems, such as CockroachDB, which is I think partly based on Postgres. Uh, at least their uh, their servers are are compatible with Postgres protocol, so you can use some of the familiar tooling with with, with their software. Uh, it's an interesting, interesting project that's uh, been uh, around for a couple of years now. So, if you're considering Spanner or, or uh, other global uh, relational systems, I, I suggest uh, giving a look at, at the open source options here. Many of these are, are still still in the works and, and require quite a bit of uh, effort to, to uh, run and, and manage, uh, but things are are moving ahead there. And it is uh, also also worth worth just uh, just uh, having a look at this to make sure, make sure that, that you're not not just uh, going for proprietary services as a de facto solution for for it. For time series uh, uses, we have a a bunch of cool uh, open source projects uh, nowadays. I think the the uh, most interesting ones for for myself are are InfluxDB. Uh, and timescale uh, DB. InfluxDB is, uh, is a standalone NoSQL database system that, that allows you to efficiently store uh, time, uh, time series data, data into, into a pretty uh, compact form and allows efficient queries uh, on it. it. It's been used a lot in uh, things like uh, system metrics monitoring and, and uh, looking at your, your uh, uh, for example, CPU graphs and, and all kinds of uh, like traditional operating system monitoring, uh, but nowadays it's finding more use cases also in, in other kinds of data. Uh, Timescale uh, is an extension to Postgres. Again, going to to uh, uh, what Christopher talked about the extensibility of Postgres and how much uh, how you can add new data types and, and new uh, data models to Postgres. 
So time scale is, is an extension of Postgres that allows you to, to uh, uh, benefit from the replication and HA and uh, tooling around Postgres while, while uh, running a compact uh, time series uh, data, data storage in, inside the database. These are also available from a, from a, as managed services from a couple of vendors, uh, and uh, I think they are finding more and more uh, use in different environments. On the proprietary uh, cloud services side, I'm not quite sure if, if there's anything that would exactly match uh, TimeScale or InfluxDB. There's, of course, Amazon's Redshift and DynamoDB that can be used in similar settings, as well as on uh, Bigtable and on Google, but it's worth taking a look at the, the time, uh, time series uh, databases and open source side before you're uh, selecting the solutions there. No. Again, as, as was mentioned in, in the previous talk, Kafka is a, is a robust and popular uh, system for message streaming. So, so no longer talking about just databases, but how do you get your data to the database in the first place? So Kafka is uh, uh, originated from, from LinkedIn, uh, where they use it to ingest a lot of uh, events and data, data from different sources and uh, processing, I think, billions of events, events uh, daily. Uh, with this system. Nowadays, Kafka is an open source project and, and uh, part of the, uh, 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 like governed by Apache uh, Foundation, so, so it's a, it's a uh, real community project. Uh, Kafka is, is used to, uh, in a lot of different analytics uh, scenarios where you get telemetry or event data from, from multiple sources and, and you have to have to collect it into a single place before before uh, processing it with different kinds of tools. Uh, Kafka differs from from uh, like message queue types of uh, systems uh, in that it doesn't really do point to point delivery, but it's a it's a shared log. So so you have producers appending to the log, and you have consumers reading from from the log, and you can have have multiple instances and multiple types of, of uh, consumers consuming from the same same uh, log. So that allows you to, to really uh, create efficient uh, uh, systems where you don't have to have to know the uh, consumers of your data uh, at the same point where you're starting to, to produce new, new data there. Uh, Kafka is, is, uh, is a pretty good alternative to, to some of the proprietary services such as Kinesis or, or PubSub that are commonly used in some of today's uh, systems. Kafka has also a bunch of advantages over, over Kinesis and, and PubSub if, if you have uh, uh, requirements around ordering of your data, making sure that uh, the events come out in the same order as, as you put them into the stream in the first place. Also, uh, Kafka is, is a pretty fast moving, moving uh, system uh, right now with, uh, with more and more tooling uh, being introduced to it uh, every, every uh, week or, or month. So now we have things like KSQL, which allow you to do SQL access directly to your Kafka stream. And there's also, also a, a bunch of tools for connecting Kafka directly to Postgres or Elasticsearch or Cassandra and other clusters. Uh, pretty similar to what, what was also mentioned in, in the previous talk. So, so as mentioned, I uh, wanted to give you just a, uh, an overview of, of how, we, how uh, different kinds of, of data pipelines are, are being, being developed nowadays with, with these open source tools. So this is an, uh, a graph that, that maps uh, pretty directly to, to some of the uh, use cases we've seen with our, our, uh, the companies we work with. So there's a number of different uh, devices out there that are pr producing events and, and telemetry and different kinds of events events for for processing. And all of them are, are sent sent directly to, to a, a Kafka cluster, which could be uh, dozens of, of brokers wide. So it's a pretty scalable system that allows you to handle billions of events events uh, daily. I think the largest ones we we work with uh, are handling something like seven billion events every day. And with Kafka, you can you can create your uh, your uh, your uh, uh, 
consumers that are written in, in any language you like and, and just consuming from, from Kafka, for example, reading metrics and, and pushing them to an InfluxDB instance for, for viewing your utilization of the, of the data. You can also use systems like Apache Beam or, or uh, uh, Flink or, or similar systems to, to do some, some transformation on the data before you uh, push it to, for example, a Cassandra cluster for long-term storage in a, and for an analytics use cases. Cassandra could be, could be just as easily replaced by Postgres in some of the uh, use cases, but this is a pr pretty typical uh, scenario we see with when you have billions of events coming in. You can also, as mentioned, use uh, Kafka Connect, which is an uh, uh, interface inside Kafka that allows you to, to directly uh, hook up Kafka to, to push events to external systems such as Elasticsearch, so you don't even have to run uh, an application server or, or anything like that that would read from Kafka. Instead, you can make sure that the latest record for a key is automatically updated in Elasticsearch or other systems. So, this is the this is uh, something that, that allows you to process billions of events just using open source source uh, systems. And I think. Have a couple of minutes minutes of available for questions before before the next talk. So, any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you.